today we'll be talking about self-care. And for those of you earlier today, I mentioned that, uh, you know, like prevention is a spectrum, self-care is also a spectrum, right? People tend to associate self-care with just healthy lifestyle, but it's also about how we manage our own acute and chronic conditions too. So, uh, you know, a lot of that has been really put under scrutiny during COVID-19 in terms of how people manage day to day without access to healthcare facilities. Today, we'll be talking about how people will get access to medications and even roles like e-pharmacies. And of course, how the public and private sector can collaborate together. I would like to call attention that the EU ASEAN Business Council did produce a report on self-care in 2020. So again, that's available for everyone's use. In that report, which of course was uh, written at the time of the pandemic, it says that 83% of people want more convenience in their health and care. But what we suffer from in this region is really a lack of formal policy around self-care, regulatory harmonization, and including things like even licensing for e-pharmacies. So that's what we'll be getting into today. In terms of agenda, what I'll do is uh, we've got three panelists. I'll introduce one at a time and let each one just kind of talk for a few minutes and I'll prompt them with a question. And then once we get through all three, happy to then have some interactions. So those of you in the room, or for those of you on the virtual platform, we'll have access to your questions too. So I really hope you take this opportunity if you're interested in this topic to make use of the great uh, guests we've got here today. So with that, no further ado, let me jump into it. First, I'll welcome in Dr. Noom. He is the RECIT ASEAN Health Policy Director based in Thailand. Uh, he's also a leader in the Self-Medication Industry Association. So Dr. Noom, would love to hear from you and especially around you know, what frameworks we have today for OTC and self-care and, and what RECIT is doing in this uh, space as well. So Dr. Noom, over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you um, for um, the um, very um, good um, opportunities and also um, for the um, RCNAU um, Business Council um, to give the um, chance to have a discussion um, on this one. Um, actually, um, I would say that um, with the situation of the um, COVID-19, yes, um, so um, basically um, we see a lot of um, things um, happening and has been um, disrupted, um, including the medical um, services. Um, and then one of the um, area that is become um, very um, important is the self-care. And then um, one of the, um, I think um, people would um, typically um, from the industry, um, poison wheel, or even the consumers, um, they would say that um, one of the things that they are not um, quite sure um, that um, it's just been moving um, to the same um, speed um, as the um, situation of the COVID have developed is the regulatory um, framework. Um, because um, the um, self-care regulatory um, framework um, is still very complicated. Um, with this, um, particularly um, to get the people um, to be able to um, self-care so they can um, stop um, using the unnecessary um, service um, from the hospital because during the COVID, um, people um, would need to do a lot of things um, for um, the um, COVID um, patient. Um, so with this, um, OTC regulatory has been regulated um, very differently um, according um, to the um, ASEAN um, country. Even though the framework itself, um, I think that um, for the big companies, um, for example, um, giving just like pharmaceutical companies or um, even um, our company, Reckitt um, itself, um, we will see that um, there is a lot of complexity that um, we um, see um, from this. Yeah, for example, the regulation that we have um, within the um, region and for um, OTC is exactly the same regulatory framework um, as the prescription. Yeah, so um, basically, um, there is no um, different um, gation and poison on that. Even though the medicine, um, for example, if you're talking about paracetamol, aspirin, um, it has been in the country, in the world um, for um, many some of the years, um, very long times ago. Yeah, but um, it's still regulated in such a way. I think that is the um, first um, complexity that um, we have. Another thing that um, is also very um, interesting um, is that because we control um, everything, um, um, with the regulatory um, framework um, in the same way. So we never apply the risk-based um, um, regulation. Um, so it means that um, we treat everything um, to be exactly the same. And this one make the um, OTC um, products or the self-care product, even supplement, um, get the difficult um, way um, to get into the consumer and to serve their need. And the other things that um, I think is um, coming um, very 
um, strongly um, that um, people, um, particularly the authorities, um, might feel that um, people um, have a bit of just like um, health literacy, that um, they're not um, capable um, to um, manage their own health. But in fact, with the COVID, um, so you can see that many successful um, things has happened. For example, just like even the patient with the COVID, they can actually do their own um, home isolation. Um, and then they're starting with the self-care. So um, the area of um, trust, the area of the literacy is the thing that is need to be um, instilled um, into the framework. And then the last one is that uh, we are not um, rely to each other because um, the thing that um, actually it should happen, similar to just like vaccine, um, that you can see that the vaccine has been approved in one country so the next country, they don't need to um, just like do a lot of work. You can just um, go in and further um, on that. Um, so I would say that um, the OTC or the self-care um, product um, regulatory um, framework um, is still the um, challenging things um, to um, tackle. Um, it's coming from the fact that um, it's look very similar to prescription. There is no risk um, concept for that. And also the thinking about the consumer, consumers should get more empowerment. And then the last one, I would say that uh, we need to have a bit of the harmonization and um, referencing um, the other country, get the best learning yeah, from the others. Um, I think that um, um, if we could um, work around this framework, um, I would see that um, we could um, get the um, better access um, to the healthcare and definitely it will be very, very powerful um, strategy to um, relieve the pressure at the um, healthcare setting that we have, particularly with the COVID. Yeah, thank you. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Noom, for kicking us off. And yes, I think definitely regulatory harmonization is something we want to kind of dig into potentially later. I see some other panelists nodding their heads in violent agreement there as well. Okay, next, let me bring in Alvin, who's the Bayer ASEAN Consumer Health Head based in the Philippines, I believe. So uh, Alvin, I know you're very passionate about democratizing a topic like self self-care. So just curious on your thoughts and what benefits self-care can bring to our society. Uh, thank you, Chris. And um, th uh, thank you also to the participants and uh, to my fellow colleagues in the panel. Well, first of all, um, not just me, but at Bayer in general, we are passionate about driving more public-private collaborations to enable consumer access to good quality self-care medicines and promoting a robust self-care framework. A lot of what Dr. Noom referred to. This is in line with Bayer's vision of health for all, hunger for none. Now, we're a major player in the areas of health and nutrition. We have aligned our sustainability targets to the United Nations Sustainability De Development Goals, or SDG, um, as we have an influence on many of the 17 goals uh, and can have the greatest impact on three of them. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. These are all very well aligned to what we do in our sustainability goals. So now let's talk about self-care, education, and access in ASEAN, something I'm very passionate about. You know, the lack of essential vitamins and minerals is a silent pandemic that impacts the most vulnerable members of society. And it actually perpetuates underdevelopment and poverty in many of our countries in ASEAN. It leads to malnutrition, reduced productivity, and a higher susceptibility to infection and disease. Bayer Consumer Health is helping to address this by partnering with governments and NGOs through various health education and donation programs that we're doing across the different countries in ASEAN today. For example, a few months ago, we kicked off our Global Nutrient Gap Initiative in Indonesia to expand access to self-care, especially for people in underserved communities. So we did this through three pillars, intervention, education, and advocacy. And, and, and this is a model that can be done and expanded, uh, not just for Bayer, but for government, for, pub, for partnerships, anywhere re related to self-care development. We organized self-care training programs on nutrition, personal hygiene, and distributed health supplements to underserved urban communities in North and West Jakarta in partnership with the local NGO and the local government. We will be expanding these kinds of activities to other countries in ASEAN, such as Vietnam, the Philippines, and Thailand in the future. So just an example of how we're living this uh, goal and this passion we have about self-care awareness. And then as a final thought, as a leading consumer healthcare company, 
It's our responsibility. We must use our scale to enable an ecosystem to advocate for access to good nutrition together with public, private, and NGO partners. It must be a collective effort. The benefit to society can be really tremendous if we capitalize on this. Imagine increased productivity and better health of our citizens to start, which will also lessen the stress on medical facilities and staff, which can then be used to prioritize more serious diseases, especially during the COVID pandemic. So back to you, Chris, but I, I hope that was able to um, articulate how important self-care is and, and how we must progress as a collective group to do this. Thank you, Alvin, and as well for your passion on the topic. I think a good reminder that a topic like self-care does apply to multiple sustainable development goals. Sometimes in these healthcare events, we get stuck on number three for universal health coverage schemes, but uh, this topic spans many of them, which, which again is a good reminder. Uh, to those in the room and, and uh, listening in, we'll have one more panelist and then we'll open things up for some discussion. So please get your questions and, and uh, ideas ready. Okay, uh, last I'd like to call in Lovey, who's with the Malaysia Community Pharmacy Guild. And as you uh, might suspect, based in Malaysia and a pharmacist by training. So uh, Lovey, just curious on what's going on with self-care there in Malaysia. And I think the topic you're interested in is more equitable access to people. So feel free to, to comment. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so basically the current self-care in Malaysia is moderate. Malaysia is very blessed with a good and generous public health care system. Most Malaysians are dependent on the public health care system as they get their medicines almost for free. However, with the recent pandemic changes, many fear and try to avoid visiting the hospitals. Most were purchased from the private sector or rely more on home delivery services. We can see an auto-increase awareness on self-care since the start of the pandemic, and not everyone has access to self-medication. Even if they have, they have to be very careful with misinformation from unreliable sources that are easily accessible, example via Dr. Google, social media, and forwarded WhatsApp messages. I'll share the recent hype on ivermectin. It is currently not approved by Ministry of Health Malaysia for the treatment of COVID. It is only used under clinical trials and for pets as an antiparasite. However, many of our community pharmacies receive calls from consumers to purchase and ask how to take the ivermectin. When you ask them where did they buy it from, they got it from their mom or via forwarded WhatsApp messages and online. And some COVID positive patients took it and had a bad reaction after taking it. And community pharmacies have been warned by Ministry of Health not to sell the drugs because if caught, we will be penalized. Of course, there will be communities who are left behind in um, Malaysia. Uh, we have what we call the B40 group, which is the bottom 40% of the Malaysian household income. They earn less than 4,850 ringgit per month, which is equivalent to Singapore dollars 1,500 per month. And we also have the refugees group, the foreign workers, elderly, especially those living alone, and those with poor health literacy. Great, thanks, Lovey. And yeah, I think, you know, like searching for health information online, self-care is one of those you can either pretend it doesn't happen and view it as a negative or just, you know, realize that actually it does happen. And so actually formalizing it and trying to not cause harm by uh, sort of not focusing on it, right, is the goal here. So thanks for reminding us on that as well. Okay, uh, well, with that, we got around sort of 15 minutes. Unfortunately, we're running a bit late. We need to get back on track with the program, but, uh, you know, we've got some prepared questions here, all of us agreed to, but I'd much rather just kind of open it up. I think some people joined the session today because they're interested in self-care. So maybe just let me check in the room first. Anyone want to be bold enough to ask the first question? Help me out. Thank you, Lainey. <laughs> I don't know if this is COVID safe to just pass the mic. But... Okay. Uh, thank you for your introduction. I want to make a question to mostly to Mr. Alvin So, but also to the rest of the panelists here. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that, you know, you brought together the United Nations goals. And one of the goals that we have for the 2025 agenda is 
It's called 25 under 25, which means how can we reduce the 25% mortality rate of non-communicable diseases by 25? And one of the tasks in the agenda is to create, design a policy so that the industry, especially the pharmaceutical industry, opens up some patents, the intellectual property of particular drugs that we know are effective to bring down the mortality rates and try to create a business model perhaps through value-based healthcare in order to make it you know, uh, beneficial both for the people and the pharmaceutical industry. And so my question is, what do you think, uh, what sort of design would enable some a, a project like this? Are you open to opening up the intellectual property of particular drugs or do you think this is a, a no-no because it doesn't make sense in terms of uh, the business model of the, of the industry? Oh. Maybe, maybe just before you answer that, you just want to step forward quickly and you can wave to them because they don't. There's Eleni, that's who just asked the question. <laughs> Give you guys on the phone a little bit more of a, a feeling of the experience here. So uh, I think, Alvin, was that directed to you first? Then obviously, if anyone else wants to answer, please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for the question. First of all, I want to reiterate that we, we are very supportive of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, what we have done in Bayer Consumer Health in order to support this, as I mentioned, is to focus on three of the goals, right? Um, and, and all 17 are important, but the three ones that we're focusing on is to no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. And I guess good health and well-being, um, part, an aspect of that is uh, reducing mortality for communicable, caused by communicable diseases. Um, one way we have done that in actual practice is going back to the nutrient gap initiative that I referred to. We spoke about education among uh, creating awareness and education on healthcare and self-care. Um, and part of that is also including sanit um, improving sanitary practices, which is a major cause of communicable diseases. Um, of course, in addition to providing access to nutrients, which also help overall health and immunity. So, I guess um, from uh, our point of view, we are very supportive and we have approached it in this manner. I'm sure there are many different models that can be done, uh, but we're happy to at least contribute to this very worthy uh, goal um, that you had mentioned. Thanks, Alvin. Did you want to touch on the kind of IP stuff or is that a little bit of a, of a touchy thing? Your choice. Uh, it's just that I'm not the expert on that. So maybe I'd rather talk about um, co topics that I can very much articulate and speak on. Sure, no worries. What about Dr. Noom, Lovi? Any, any of you guys want to comment on this question? Yeah, maybe um, I um, just um, would like to uh, maybe um, add that um, some point. I'm um, similar to Alvin uh, mentioned um, also that um, I think the self-care um, itself, um, this one is the foundation. And the key things um, is that um, if we actually um, install um, this um, health um, practice um, into the people and people understand the benefit of um, taking um, their self-care because actually they can do seven days, they can do um, 24 hours, right? Um, um, because um, it's um, actually a part of themselves. Um, it should be um, presented in such a way that um, it's um, holistic. Um, for example, just like Alvin also mentioned, that um, nutrition also is the foundation. Yeah, but it's also related um, to the um, others. And um, for example, just like um, the um, physical exercise um, or otherwise the um, basic um, minor illness um, treatment. And the um, other area that, um, um, for example, just like um, in the um, pharmaceutical um, industry, including um, racket, uh, we are doing um, quite a lot on this is to um, try to understand the values um, of the self-care and then um, see whether um, can we make it uh, much more um, tangible. Yeah, for example, just like um, get the health outcome um, to say that how much productivity is that um, you have when you get rid of your pain. Yeah, some or um, anything related to your sore throat and um, with that um, you get the um, better some um, work and performance um, from that. Um, so basically it's no longer the miss, um, it will be something that's very um, tangible and also it's also um, be just like the um, early um, stage of the health um, journey. Um, so um, I, I think that um, the self-care um, is playing um, some roles um, as the um, starting points of, of, the, of the health and then eventually it will get into the 
um, goals that everyone is aiming for um, is to um, have the better health, um, achieve the um, development um, goals, and then some also um, reduce um, sickness and also mortality. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Lovi. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so basically, I'm also not an expert, but um, I would share uh, one of the example of one of the drugs uh, that was uh, considered given given compulsory license for generic sofos buvir. Uh, so it's a hepatitis C medication uh, that was uh, made available in Malaysia because um, there were many consumers and patients that were suffering because the price of the actual uh, branded drug was about 300,000 ringgit per patient, which is about US 71,300. And, uh, and Compared to the generic version of the drug, there was only 1,000 ringgit or US 237 per patient. So I guess this is all very dependent on respective country government uh, to put in the effort whether they want to take, um, take up this uh, challenge, right, to help to save as many patients as possible. Great, thanks. And for those online, I will alternate back and forth between questions in the room and online. I'm just waiting to be fed the online uh, channel there. So please keep putting your questions in. Did that help, uh, Eleni? Anything else you want to add or are you okay? okay. A little commentary here uh, from the original question ask. A small comment is just that, you know, when we're talking about how do we improve access to medicine, it comes down to creating a framework where companies can profit, they can produce, and it makes, it makes sense to have clinical trials and have biocompliance and make sure that this is something that we can do. But at the same time, the WIPO, you know, the, the, the organization that is seeing all globally the, the the intellectual property of different drugs needs to intervene and the United Nations and the WHO needs to intervene and see, okay, if we have a target, if we want to be realistic about it, something has to give. And at this point, this is why I'm saying that several industries need to take a step back and say for one or two drugs that we think our primary goal, maybe we need to give away the intellectual property and find another model which makes sense for the industry, like a value-based healthcare in order to make profit for them as well. So I think it's very difficult uh, conversation, a, ma a major debate, but uh, thank you for your answers. Thanks for getting us started. And this is a breakout you know, session, so I think it's okay to you know, get stuff on the table. Anyone else have yeah, further comments? Uh, oh, go, yeah, go ahead, Alvin. I think very, very valid points. Now, uh, maybe it brings us back to the, where we are today, which is self-care, right? So, so, so self-care by nature, these are generally uh, non-prescription medicines, right? And even if we're non-prescription, I'm sure everybody here uh, will agree, we can make a difference, right? Uh, with our nutritional products, with our um, cold and cough remedies, with our allergy. Um, so maybe they're not life-saving, but they make a difference. And in the long term, they can actually lower um, terminal illness or, 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 or mortalities. Now, we talked about access, and I think a very important um, topic for non-prescription products or self-care is creating this access to more and more citizens and consumers. Um, and clearly, uh, you mentioned the uh, survey results from last year, right, where over 80% of uh, respondents in ASEAN were looking for more access to medication and self-care. They're asking for it. But today, there's still a lot of room. There's still a lot we can do to progress this. Um, the regulatory framework today um, is not so consistent in classifying non-prescription or prescription products. For example, we see in different rules in different countries, which lead to the same product um, being a prescription product in one country and a non-prescription product in another in ASEAN. And, and if you think about it, why? Why does that have to be the case? Why can't we provide access to more and more consumers? And then of course, there's the channel access. So all of us can relate to using online, uh, online access through e-pharmacy and online sales, especially during the pandemic. Now, currently online availability of non-prescription medicines still have various restrictions in some of our countries in ASEAN, uh, whether in terms of being available or in terms of providing information or promotions. I believe during this time of movement restrictions and social distancing, we should enable our citizens to better access non-prescription medicines by providing a better framework and clarity 
on uh, online access, as an example. That can make a tangible difference in the short term. So I just wanted to comment on that from that perspective of self-care medicine. Yeah, it's one of those situations where there's no single answer for every channel. So there's a lot of sub layers to this conversation here. Um, again, Dr. Noom, love you anything else to add or shall I take another question? Go ahead, Dr. Noom, yep. Um, yes, um, I, um, one, one of the other things that um, I think is also um, important, um, we have not um, actually touched on that, is also the um, availability of the medicine that um, is safe enough. Um, and then it can be the self-care um, medicines um, or self-care products um, because that one, um, it would mean that you get uh, more access. And then um, the thing that actually is improved, um, for example, just like um, several um, antihistamine and several um, PPI, um, or um, I would say just like um, MSA, the classical one, one actually is get uh, much more um, access because it's improved um, the safety and um, poison bill um, that um, is safe for the general population. And when it gets into the um, um, consumers, um, the industry um, um, actually um, start to um, get into that and they, they don't have the patents um, on that. And then eventually um, you see the competitive uh, market. Um, and then um, actually it's, it's good for the consumer. Yeah, because um, you start to see that um, you have much more of the um, offering um, from the um, company. The company trying to add the um, value added um, into the um, products and then the product um, actually is has been um, safer. Um, so I would say that um, several things is going to, um, to also um, work. Um, even just like um, we know ourselves that um, we might not um, address the uh, majority of the um, reason of the mortality because um, self-care is quite um, focused on the minor illness. Yeah, but um, do we have um, some, something to play, um, I would say. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Noom. Lobi, anything else you want to add or shall I take another question? Go ahead, Lobi, yep. Yeah, maybe I'll just share a little bit. Um, so basically, it's all very dependent on the lobbyists, the stakeholders, and also the policy makers, especially, right? They all have to work together. And um, and it's more, I mean, the, with the more switches that are happening, like from POM to P, P to OTC and whatnot, right? Um, this will also help to reduce the healthcare burden uh, financially for countries. Okay, great. Uh, we got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anyone else from the floor want to raise something? Yes, go ahead, Candice. Maybe you can come into view so they can feel. Uh... Thank you. Hi, um, I just want to ask, I think health literacy is a big thing um, for self-access. And you, if you want the consumers to drive that demand, we also need to address the fact that health literacy across Asia is very diversified. And of course, there are also restrictions on how industry can reach out to help to bridge that gap. No, I'd just like to hear from the panel on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we touched a little bit on that in the opening here and about how COVID-19 has affected some of this. But yeah, anyone want to start on health literacy? Go ahead, Dr. Noom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, when I mean, you want to start first. <laughs> okay. Yes, please okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Do you yeah. start first? I'm happy. All right. All right. Um, so we've all seen this, right? We've all seen accelerated consumer digital adoption of in ASEAN when it comes to looking for health literacy, especially because we're not allowed, we're, we're prevented from going to hospitals in a way because of movement restrictions at any point in time, right? So um, fully agree that uh, increasing health awareness and literacy is really, really important. Education, as I spoke about earlier, it's how we do it, right? And, and let's take advantage of this big momentum shift driven by the pandemic. Everybody's moving really fast to digital. You see this in e-consultations, right? Where a patients would, rather than visiting a doctor in the hospital or a clinic, would, would do a, an e-consult. So, so these are ways that we can do and we should take full advantage. Um, interestingly, it, in some countries, these consultations even lead to a prescription that's online, right? So it's no longer a physical prescription. It's actually a written, uh, it's actually an online prescription. But what's the problem? The problem is then when the patient gets it, they still have to go physically to a drugstore to buy the prescription product. So, I mean, maybe my reaction is fully agree, but I think there's still work to be done if we really wanna move the momentum um, towards better access and better education um, on healthcare. Thanks, Alvin. 
Dr. Yeah, Jamova, too. I think that um, one of the things that um, I would say that uh, um, everyone um, has been um, aware, I, I just would like to introduce some um, another um, um, factors and stakeholders that um, can also help um, with the um, health and literacy. Um, I think that um, it could be um, the first one is coming from the government. Um, because um, unless the government um, really invest on this and then um, allow the platform um, to have the health literacy, because sometimes the health literacy from authority points of view, particularly um, with the FDA, um, they might view that um, this one is the um, health um, product um, advertisement, yeah, or maybe um, health product um, promotion. But in fact, um, um, actually, um, you can um, modify um, your message and um, you can um, gear um, toward the objective of um, getting the people to know um, their, their own health. And then of course, um, it might also coming up with the solution of the treatment option um, unavoidably. Yeah, but I think that um, stakeholder, the first one um, is important is the government need to um, really um, open on that. Um, and then it need to be holistic. Um, it cannot just be come from the Ministry of Public Health, also need to come from the Ministry of um, Education um, also. The other part, um, I think that uh, because we also have um, low on also on this one is the role of the pharmacist. Um, because the um, role of the pharmacist is very important um, because, um, uh, frankly speaking, um, right now um, with the COVID, I'm just like, um, you get the um, um, lockdowns. Um, it's very di difficult to um, actually access them to your doctor. Yeah, so the um, easiest um, resource, um, the um, powerful, the impactful um, um, resource um, actually is the pharmacist. It could be community um, pharmacists. Um, so community pharmacists, if they get them equipped on how to improve the health literacy, how to actually um, use the different um, communication and technique, um, because um, I think that for um, pharmacists, um, they are already attached to the community, just like um, we might need to upskill um, them yeah, to make sure that um, they could be the um, a kind of the literacy um, promoter. Um, I think that um, I just would like to add um, this um, two point that um, have um, the multiple player um, to help all together, um, the um, health threat and um, literacy um, could um, become um, much more um, improving. And of course, I think that the, the thing that um, um, Alvin also mentioned is the digital literacy, which also coming together with this. Um, I think that every country um, right now, you get a kind of the um, application um, that um, you need to put on your mobile phone um, to um, locate your GPS um, because of the COVID um, situation. And so you know where um, you grow, going through, right? So that one is the disruptor. Um, so you never know that um, you become quite um, digitally um, literate, um, actually, yeah, because of that. Yeah, so I think that um, we should take that momentum, combine it and get the stakeholder and see that um, how we can move this forward. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I want to come back to digital information in just a minute, but you touched on the role of the pharmacists. And I think probably to some extent in this part of the world, it's, it's an undervalued role compared to what we see in other, other places. Uh, maybe Lovi, you want to comment on Dr. Noom's point there? Yeah, thank you for trusting pharmacists. Um, so basically, um, we are one of the most trusted and uh, accessible healthcare professionals made available, uh, not just uh, in Malaysia, but also globally. And um, that is where you differentiate uh, yourself from other like sort of online platforms because we practice evidence-based practice uh, so that consumers will not be scammed as well. Uh, especially during pandemic, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, scammers and opportunists that will try to devour their victims, you know? and uh, by sharing all this misinformation via forwarded WhatsApp messages. And um, I believe self-care also uh, have to start from young, at a very young age, uh, from your own home. And I believe the pandemic has taught many to follow SOPs, like just a simple basic things like hand washing, sanitizing, wearing your face mask, take care of your own health by boosting your immune system. And not just depending on the government, as they are already overburdened in terms of resources and finances. And I guess uh, even for different countries, we have to work with Ministry of Education to include uh, some of the self-care modules into their curriculum and in school so that you can prepare them early and not at the last minute. And uh, I believe uh, all stakeholders must work together 
to win this uh, war uh, and this COVID war. Yeah. Thanks. I was going to touch on mis misinformation too, because I think all of you have said we have a real opportunity right now with COVID-19 and some boost to average health literacy. I think one of the bigger issues we face now is misinformation. I was having a conversation with this on some of their day and the thinking was, okay, well, what do you want to do to prevent a cybersecurity hack? You hire the hackers, right? It's almost like we need to hire the people who are spreading all this misinformation so that bring them onto the, the good side because their tactics are, are quite advanced, unfortunately, you know? Uh, I do want to start wrapping things up to get us back on the program time. I have a final question here, but let me just check. I'm happy to give that spot to anyone in the room. Anyone want to ask one more thing? Yes, Dan. Come into camera view. Okay, so um, uh, my questions are kind of a, an infrastructure question, and we've, we've touched um, a little bit on uh, the proliferation of platforms and of the digital patient. And my question really is, do we think enough is being done to protect patient data in this uh, new environment? And if not, what else uh, can be done about it? Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Anyone want to start there? Um, maybe I could um, start. Yep. Um, so um, I think that um, one of the things that um, we also um, put them um, this um, as the main themes. I just um, maybe um, pick up one of the area, which is the um, e-pharmacy or the virtual um, pharmacy, um, which um, could be um, starting as the um, extended um, service um, of the physical um, store. Um, but um, in some um, market, um, in some country, um, it could um, become uh, just like um, even um, standalone um, online um, pharmacies. Um, with this um, one, um, one of the um, key things that is very um, important here yeah, for the um, e-pharmacy or any um, platform um, related to this um, is um, actually um, two part. Um, I would say that the first one is the benefit um, of the um, consumer. So there might be some um, functionality that um, you could have the direct um, message and um, direct um, chat um, with the pharmacist um, or the duty um, person. Um, or um, even um, just like if it become very, very um, um, easy question, it's good to um, manage them um, through the um, basic um, filtering, um, just like chatbot or something like this. Um, so you will start to collect a lot of health data yeah, into the system. And then the second one um, is in terms of the um, rates of the um, platform. Yeah, for example, just like because you're going to store um, the health information. Um, so I would say that um, one of the things that is very important to make the successful um, platform, yeah, just to pick up the example of the e-pharmacy because it might be related to self-care, is um, also on the quality control um, on one of the domain. Um, one of the um, interesting um, points that uh, within ASEAN, um, there has been um, a lot of um, play that's starting um, to do, um, I think it's my start um, from um, telemedicine. Yeah, and then eventually it's um, spin off um, into the um, telepharmacy or um, maybe e-pharmacy is to have the quality control. And then some one part of the quality control is the infrastructure. Yeah, for example, just like how you make sure that you have the IT security, um, whether your country um, have um, implement um, the um, data and privacy and protection. Um, so um, a lot of things um, has been um, considered on that part. Um, I think the key thing is that um, we need to see um, whether um, the platform is useful or not. We realize that there is the risk um, work together and see um, whether um, is there any systemic way um, to put the quality control on that. Yeah, particularly on the um, question that asking about the infrastructure. Yeah, but um, this one is not the um, just like the first thing that is happening um, in the world. So we can learn from particularly just like. UK or Europe, um, where they have the established uh, model, yeah, particularly if we're talking about um, the regulation also, even um, GDPR, yeah, it's also originated um, from um, Europe also on data privacy. Yeah, I think it's one of those two we talk about, harmonization, it's not just harmonization of self-care policy in the region, but harmonization amongst policies as well. And whether it be the rollout of national patient identifiers in the region or telehealth legislation or other kind of cloud protocols, right? I mean, we just need to make sure that self-care gets interwoven into that discussion, I think, is, is part of the, the key here, too. I don't know, Alvin, uh, Lovi, any kind of final comments before we wrap things up, either on that topic or whatever else you want to say? Yeah, I can touch on that topic. 
Yeah, so basically I think um, this uh, patient data and IP, it's not just affecting the healthcare industry, right? Even banking industry. I mean, uh, but I guess it's all about, it takes time as well as time goes by. I'm sure like the IT companies, the software, they will improve their security system as well. Uh, that is why even for the company I work for, uh, we also used uh, facial recognition and password authentication as well. Uh, so to improve uh, all this security uh, for, so that uh, hackers can't um, you know, hack into the system and et cetera, right? And um, maybe I'll touch a little bit more on the e-pharmacy solutions. Um, speaking from my experience, um, I believe like for our country, our Poisons Act has been established since 1952 and it hasn't changed until today. So unfortunately, the law hasn't even caught up with technology and innovation. Uh, when I first came back from the UK and Singapore, I founded Lovey Pharmacy, which is a specialty brick and click pharmacy back in 2011. We were the first to launch e-consultation services, which is our Ask Your Pharmacy service. And when I first launched it, it was so new to even the Ministry of Health. They were unsure whether it was legal or not. But they say that, oh, if it adds value, there is no restriction. After that, I set up the online and home delivery service. Uh, within 24 hours turnaround time and fast track uh, two hours delivery services within the city. And we realized that there is more to just uh, being limited to selling o OTCs, vitamins and supplements. We use digital technology to enable and ensure a smoother patient experience. That is when uh, Lovey Pharmacy partnered doctor to you which is a med tech app for house calls and e-prescription services. And we had to ensure that all the processes were right in the legal context. And we engaged the Ministry of Health instead of being in a battle with them. It turned out that I had to thank them for being my free consultants, for providing me ideas on how to improve the entire work process flow. And I still recall the enforcement head of pharmaceutical services division mentioned, in the eyes of the law, it might not be right, but in the spirit of the law, it is good. So we will not restrict this innovation and just enable it as they realize that they will also retire soon and maybe be one of our clients in the near future who will require medicines to be delivered to their doorstep. And in fact, they hope we do not charge or increase our delivery fees because we have been providing it for free uh, since back then, right? And um, I think even pharmacy, every pharmacy has a different business model. It depends on whether the employers are willing to invest on digitalizing their business. Last time, softwares and hardwares could cost a bomb, but for this nowadays, you don't feel it that much because uh, vendors are providing easy money payments. So pharmacy owners have to think whether they want to disrupt or they want to get disrupted, okay? Thanks, Lovi. Yeah, and there's always, you know, a bit of an off pace between innovation and regulation, but hopefully we can kind of keep that spirit going and push things forward. Uh, Alvin, any, any final words from you before we close things off here? Yeah, so maybe just to wrap it up in general, I think um, clearly there's a benefit to society and to our citizens in ASEAN for increasing self-care awareness and access. We talked a lot about that in today's session. I think there's, a, there's work that needs to be done um, and it has to be a partnership between private sector, NGOs and public and government. And all of this is really for the benefit of our citizens. And I think we need to frame it that way. We can make a difference as stakeholders in self-care, advocates of self-care, but we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. And who will benefit our citizens? And I think that's enough incentive for all of us collectively to, 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 to make these updates, you know, modernization of regulation, understanding the current situation, what our citizens are actually looking for that we're not providing them. I think that's an important takeaway uh, from this panel session. Thank you. Well, many thanks to all of our panelists. And I would also like to thank people in the room for driving some interaction. That was a bit of fun. I think at one point we mentioned the failure to address self-care as a silent pandemic. So that's maybe something to think about as we go away. 
I also think self-care is one of those topics that can be very personal too. So I hope people join this session and, and kind of join the effort forward and maybe just their own uh, personal capacity interest as well. Uh, so with that, we'll close things off.